just finished a series on prayer. The importance of prayer, the power of prayer, how we need to pray big and not little. And today, we're going to talk about the biggest, the biggest cause to stop those prayers. Today, we're going to deal with a giant of doubt. Doubt. Have you ever prayed something real big and you're expecting God to do something and it don't happen? You ever done that? And then you start to doubt. Let's jump right into the Word today. Open your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 11. We're going to get in here. We're going to see how doubt plays an important role in a lot of people's lives, including those in Scripture. And so we're going to begin. But I really do believe that God is going to challenge us today. He's going to change us today. He's going to speak to us today through this. Are you, are you ready for that? You ready for God to speak to you today? Wow. Are we asleep still? I mean, it is after, it's almost 11 o'clock. Are you ready for God to speak today? Let's get at him. Let's hear what he's got to say for us. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 2. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all these things the Messiah was doing. So, oh, two-letter word. Stop. Let's talk about it. Two-letter word. Coordinating conjunction. How many of you remember that from your days in sophomore English in high school? You had a coordinating conjunction. It means what he's getting ready to do is based on what just happened. And so he has heard about everything that Jesus was doing, and it caused him to question it. And so... He sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah that we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? Isn't it weird when Jesus' actions cause us to doubt his authenticity? When Jesus zigs and we zag. Ever been there, done that? Isn't it crazy? We're kind of left just out there. We're hanging out to dry. Well, let me tell you what's happening in this moment. This is a moment of unmet expectations. Unmet expectations. John the Baptist probably believed that when Jesus came, he was going to overthrow the Roman Empire. That's what most believed in his day. And then he was going to set the Jewish people up in their rightful place of rule. Then he was just going to dust off his hands. It's going to be an awesome day. Messiah's going to ride in. He's going to crush it. But he didn't. He came in. He was healing the sick. He came with a message of love. And it just wasn't what John expected. So it caused John to face this giant in his life, massive giant of doubt. Because it didn't work the way that he thought it should work. Ever happened to you? You thought something was going to work out one way and it didn't work out the way you thought it was going to happen? That's I, I, happened a lot in my life. Like one time, I, there's this really nice restaurant over in the Orville area and I said, man, I just talked it up and talked it up and talked it up, right? So I invited some friends to go over there and we're sitting there eating and I said, isn't this a great place? <clears throat> yeah, 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 it is. They didn't like it. But yet I had built it up. Unmet expectations. Because they had expected something that I had built up so great. And there it was. Not what I thought was so good. But what do we do when that happens in our faith? When we think God's going to come through on something big in our life and he doesn't do it the way we wanted him to. Or what you th thought he would do. How do you handle unmet expectations with Jesus? Catch this. God doesn't always live up to your expectations. God doesn't always live up to your expectations, but he always lives up to his word. He don't live up to my expectations. He doesn't live up to your expectations, but he does live up to his word. When he said, I will be with you, count on it. He will be with you. When he said, I will never leave you, it's there. He will never leave you. The truth is, 
that makes for some really great preaching, but it makes for some very hard living. Because when he said, I will never leave you, let me see a show of hands. How many of you have ever felt like he has left you? We've all been there. We've all done that. And here's what we got to understand, and here's the challenge that we all face. God is always on time. Did you know that? God is always on time, and I believe that. But that's the problem. Whose time's he on? Whose time is it? If he's an on time God, can I tell you something? He's not on my time. Is he on your time? No. He's on his time. Because, listen, there's been moments that I thought he was going to come through and do something, and he didn't. And whenever I deal with those unmet expectations, it creates this giant of doubt in my life. What do you do when you doubt God? Let's be honest. After all, we're sitting in church this morning, right? So let's be honest while we're here. How many of you have doubted him? You've doubted what was going to happen? You declared something in faith and then you wondered, where's he at? I'm going to tell you what, if you've ever doubted God, you're in some pretty good company. Did you know that? Because there's a whole lot of other people that doubted God too, and we're just going to go to his word, and we're going to look at a few of those who've doubted God, and we're going to begin in the, the book of Job. Job chapter 14, verse 19. Listen, Job was the greatest believer of his day. Satan wanted to test somebody, and God said, hey, won't you trust my servant Job? And Job said, hey, God, I thought we were buds. And you're going to let this happen? But yeah, so he thought, you know, this is what he says in Job 13, 15. This is what we like to read. Job 13, 15 says, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Oh, what faith that is, right? Jump back to Job chapter 14, verse 19. Job 14, 19 says, As waters waste away the stones, and as floods wash away the soil of the earth. Listen to this. So you, O oh Lord, destroy the hope of man. Okay, we're dismissed. We'll see you next week. Right? Is that depressing or what? Right? Job had a doubt. Destroy the hope of man. And then you move on. You read, how about Jeremiah? Jeremiah was a powerhouse prophet. Right? He, he felt completely forgotten. Jeremiah 15, 18 says this. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable which resisteth to be healed? And then he says something really scary. This is really scary. Wilt thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as waters fail? Anybody in here have enough guts to call God a liar? Jeremiah did. He called God a liar. That's crazy. And yet Jeremiah's a prophet. He's got two books in the Bible. One of them even has his name. And yet that's where he was. And then there was somebody who, you don't get any greater than this. You don't get any greater than Elijah. Elijah was a powerhouse man of God. When Elijah prayed, stuff happened, right? Elijah, Elijah prays, it's not going to rain. He doesn't want any rain. It doesn't rain for three stinking years. Think about that. That's a powerhouse prayer. He's wanting to show the people of God the power of God. And so after three years, he says, okay, folks, you got to listen. These false gods that you've worshipped, these idols that you've worshipped, let's have a test and let's see if they can live up to the faith that you've placed in them. So he picks a fight. He picks a fight with the prophets of Baal. And he says, meet me on the mountain. And you build an altar to your God, and I'll build an altar to my God, and you pray to your God, and I'll pray to my God, and whichever God answers by fire, that's the true God. Now, that's not really a good way to settle arguments in an office building, but we're in the Old Testament here, and so we're doing things a little different, right? They build the altar, and they pray all day. And listen, if you don't believe the Word of God has a sense of humor, go read this story. It's hilarious to me. You know, he start, 
he starts off and they start praying and he starts bagging on them. <laughs> Look at these guys. Look what they're doing. They're foolish. They're praying, they're praying to somebody that doesn't exist. And he's just giving them a hardest time that he can give them. And, and then he says some stuff that I just think is absolutely great. He says to them, hey, did you schedule a time with your God? Maybe he's on vacation. Hmm. Or, let's get a little deeper. He says, scream a little louder. Because maybe your God's asleep and he's a heavy sleeper. I mean, listen to this. Elijah, he's a rude dude. Right? He's just rude. So when I get to heaven, I'm going to high-five him and say, you were rude, but you were awesome. This is great. I love, and then the, the last thing, this is one I really love. He, uh, he says, maybe your God can't answer because he's on the toilet. I love that. It's a sense of humor in the Word of God. That's what we have. I can't wait to meet, the, meet him and see what he's done. And when they're done praying to their God, Elijah says, is it my turn? Can I go now? Yeah, yeah, it's your turn. Go ahead. You go ahead and do it. Okay, I'm going to go now. You're good, you're good with this, right? And so Elijah, he builds his altar. He puts his sacrifice on it. He digs a trench around it. Now remember, it hasn't rained for three years, and so what he does next really probably infuriated a lot of people because he took that precious commodity called water and he poured it all over the sacrifice and all over the wood and filled the trench with the water. And then he prays. Little one-paragraph prayer, and fire falls from heaven. And consumes the only it consumes not only the sacrifice, but it destroys the altar. And I love what King James says. It says it laps up the water in the trench. And he turns and he looks at the prophets as male and he says, How do you like me now? Well, something like that anyway. Not exactly his words. But then he turns to the king and he says, Listen, you better run. Because it's getting ready to rain. Hadn't rained for three years. And Elijah goes and he buries his face in the ground and he prays. And the rain begins to fall. And then, I love this part, and then when the rain starts falling, he feels it on his back. He jumps up and he runs down the mountain and he runs so fast, he outruns the king in his chariot to get down the mountain. That is an anointed man of God. Think about that. And then something happens. He gets this threatening letter from the queen. And it says something like this. And that's going to be paraphrased, okay? Just so you understand. You're Elijah, comma. Don't like what you did to my prophets, exclamation point. You killed them, sad face emoji. Not happy with it, mad face emoji. Going to kill you back, going to kill you till you're dead. Sincerely, the queen. Hashtag, you better run, sucker. Right? That's my paraphrase. Think about this. The powerhouse, Elijah, the prophet of God, caused it to stop raining, caused it to rain after he brought fire from heaven to consume the altar. If you're Elijah, how are you going to respond to this? <laughs> I'm going to be like, hey, dude. Lady, calm down. I'm going to go back to sleep. Right? I, I am so grateful that God didn't give me the ability to cast down fire from heaven when I was a young guy. You know what I mean? Because in junior high, there had been a lot of people running around with singed hair. Think about it. I mean, look how he responds. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 3. Elijah was afraid. And he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and left his servant there. Folks, that is a response of absolute doubt. He just came down off of a mountain where God just did an amazing thing, and now he's facing a massive giant of doubt. 
Verse 4 says, then he went alone, and, and part of that is a problem. Look at this in verse 4. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. Therein lies a huge problem, folks. That's a huge problem. That's why we encourage everyone to be involved in a small group or to be involved in a Sunday school class is because we need, to peop- we need people around us. We need around other people so that we never have to go through a desert experience alone. We see what happened to Elijah when he did. As a matter of fact, being alone is the first thing that God confronted after he created Adam and Eve, did he not? He created Adam, he looked at him and said, it's not good for man to be alone. So then he created Eve. And all the men said, oh man. Well, I know where we stand, ladies, they're all yours, you can do with them what you want. I was looking for the response, amen, right? Amen, we, we, he created a woman for us. But that's not good for man to be alone. He created Eve, and then... But Elijah went alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. Now I want you to notice what happens here. He sat down under a solitary broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. This man of God, with the power of God, who prays so powerfully, yet now we find him, he's still praying. Please understand that. He's still praying. He's still talking to God, but the nature of his prayer have dramatically changed. Look what he says. He says, I've had enough. Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who've already died. You know one of the first things that happens when we get into doubt? Here's one of the first things that happens is we begin to get locked in to the comparison trap. The comparison trap. We want to compare to everybody else. Elijah says, I'm no better than my ancestors who've already died. You know, what we don't often talk about with this man Elijah is we don't talk about this prophet of God. He was he was dealing with suicidal depression. That's exactly what's happening here. Now, I studied this, and I'm like, okay, what changed with Elijah? Because, listen, that guy, when he's on the mountain, he's got some swagger. He's tormenting them prophets of Baal. He's teasing them. He's doing whatever. He's got swagger. He's walking in, bare chested, shoulders back. Hey, it's not going to rain. Doesn't rain for three years. Hey, here comes fire from heaven. Boom, here it comes. Then it's going to rain again, and then it started raining. Listen, the only thing different between the previous threats that he had gotten and the current threat was where it came from. The threat he just got came from a woman. Don't go there. I get it, right? You do know, that, go back to the old saying, you do know that, the, the only, uh, that only the wrath of God is stronger than the wrath of a woman. You know that, right? That's not my saying. I found that. Where are all of our moms? Raise your hands if you're a mom. Raise your hand. I just want to tell you that we love you and we honor you. But the truth is, we're scared of you. Right? That's the truth. Listen, how many of you, when you were growing up, got spankings when you were a kid? Let me see your hands. You got spankings when you were a kid? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of you are sitting here today because you did get those spankings, so don't go bl- blaming mom and dad for anything. You needed them, and that's why you're here. But can I tell you something? I never got a spanking in my life. I never got one spanking. I got a whooping. <laughs> a spanking is, ooh, ow, ooh, ow, don't do that, that hurts. No, no. A whooping is, I can't feel my legs. And then you walk with a limp for a week, right? That, that's what the whooping is. And, and with dad, you knew what was coming. You knew where dad stood, right? Dad was like, hey, quit that. Quit it. And if you heard the word now, you're done, right? That's where dad was. Quit it. Dad said, quit it. I'm quitting it. Sometimes dad didn't have to say anything, did he? He just gave you that look. And you know if you didn't stop what you were doing, you knew what was coming. But Dad had that line, and you knew where to stop. He didn't have to say anything sometimes. You knew where Dad's line was. But 
How many of you knew where mom's line was? Like I'm talking with mom one day and I looked at her and said, oh, whatever, mom. And she said, oh, yeah, whatever. The next day, next day, whatever, mom. Don't you ever use that word with me again. What happened? I don't know what happened. I don't know where the line went. Right? Don't ever say that to me. What changed? Listen, moms, you have a gift. You have a gift that you can say full, completely understandable sentences to your children anyway through clenched teeth. You know that? Nobody else knows what you're saying, but your kids do. They understand it. And I tell you, listen, that's a talent. And, and it, me and a friend were standing in front of mom one day, and she did that with the clenched teeth, and she was telling, telling us what was going to happen. And Larry standing beside me, and he looked at me, what'd she say? I said, she told me I'm going to die. And if you stand here much longer, you're going to die too. He was gone. But we just don't know where mom's line is. We knew where dad's was. I just say that for a little fun because with Elijah, I don't know what happened. I don't believe it's just because the threat came from a woman. I think it's probably more because he was alone. He was tired. Maybe it's because he was by himself without his servants with him. But listen, if we go back to our text in Matthew chapter 11, John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, right? And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, and the voice of the Father says, this is my Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And then we find John in the text in Matthew chapter 11, 2 and 3. Let's read it again. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all these things the Messiah was doing, so he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah that we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? How do you get in that spot where John is when you've seen God do great things and now you're doubting as to whether or not he is who he says he is? One thing shifted in John's life from the baptism moment to where he's at now because he's in prison. Something to take note of. And number two, here it is, a prison perspective will always cause you to doubt your destiny. A prison perspective will always cause you to doubt your destiny. Man, you could have a great moment of faith. You could believe that great things are going to happen in your life. Maybe it's a, the positive power uh, thinking. But, but all of a sudden, you get into a, a spot. You get into a rough time. Maybe it's in your marriage. You thought it was going to turn out one way, and it didn't turn out the way you thought it was going to. Maybe it's in your life in general. Maybe you say something like, man, I thought I'd be further along than I am now. Look at them over there, man. They're, they're doing well. Why am, why am I not doing so well? Maybe somebody lets you down at some point in your life. Or let's be really honest today. Maybe it's just you. Maybe it's your repetitive sin habits that you really keep trying to discipline yourself past. And you keep struggling and you keep failing. And you keep saying something like, yeah, God could never love somebody like me. Read the book. Read the book. Because there are people that he loved through their pain and through their heartache, through their mess-ups, through their mistakes, through their failures. Jesus always loved them. And that brings me to the third thing I want you to hear. Your faith is more important than your failure. Your faith is more important than your failure. God's more interested in your future then he is your failure. And folks, all you got to do when you, to understand it, look at Simon Peter. That's all we got to do. Go look at Simon Peter. I'm going to tell you what, Simon Peter could not be hired at Southport Heights Christian Church. I wouldn't hire him. Would you hire him? Think about Simon Peter. He cussed all the time. He cut people's ears off. He was violent. He said one thing and he'd do something else. He was proud. But Jesus loved him. In fact, Jesus and Simon are having this moment. 
Peter looks at Jesus and he's been, I'm always going to be with you, dude. I am never going to leave you. I'm going to be right here. I'm your ride or die. When all those other guys over there, see them? When they're all gone, yep. I'm still going to be here. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, Jesus gives his response to that. Jesus said, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, and indeed Satan asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith should not fail and that when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Now, folks, let me just share, that's a very non-religious prayer. Very strange prayer. Because, listen, if it's a religious prayer, what are you going to pray for? I'm going to pray that Peter doesn't fail. I'm going to pray that he quits messing up. I'm going to pray that he quits embarrassing me, right? That's what a religious prayer looks like. But Jesus actually predicts through the things he doesn't say that Peter's going to fail. But not only is he going to fail, he's going to fail a whole bunch of times before the night's over. But listen, Peter. Jesus says, I'm going to love you through it all. And when you've returned to me, I want you to strengthen your brethren. What's that mean? What's that mean? It means as many times as you mess up, I'm going to keep making mercy. Hmm. That's what Jesus does. He keeps making mercy. As a matter of fact, every morning when you awake, Scripture tells us there's new mercies waiting on you. That's what Jesus does. He makes mercy. It's new every day. As a matter of fact, with, with Simon, Jesus even says, hey, I still got a place for you in leadership. Folks, that's a powerful moment. But there's another one very similar to that in how powerful it is, found in Mark chapter 9. Man brings his son to Jesus. He's already taken his son to the disciples. He asked the disciples to pray for him. They prayed for him. And there was unmet expectations. Because when the disciples prayed for him, he was not healed. Their assumption was, their expectation was that when, they prayed, when the disciples prayed for him, he would be healed. So the church, the disciples, the church, let him down. And so he, uh, he goes on, though, and he goes to Jesus. Look what he says. Can you heal my son? Mark 29, 23, and 24. Jesus said to him, if you can believe... All things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of child cried and said with tears. Listen, he's being super honest here. Can you imagine being in front of Jesus and praying this? And he looks up and he says, Lord, I believe. And then there's all this stuff happening in his heart and in his head. And he says, help me in my unbelief. Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. I know I'm standing right here in front of you, and I believe, don't believe. How does Jesus respond to that? Does he say, go to the back of the line? Does he look at him and say, no soup for you today? For my Seinfeld friends, you get that. Go get some more faith. Go get your group around you. Pray yourself into more faith. And then come back up here and stop embarrassing me. Tell what Jesus says. No. Jesus heals his son. And we need to understand this because this is big for you and me. This is big. Number four, even when you doubt, God still shows up. Even when you doubt, God still shows up. Even in the midst of doubt, fear, anxiety, depression, loneliness, I don't care. I don't know what's going to happen. God still shows up. He's still there. Listen, God never said it's going to be easy. He never said it'd be easy. He said, I'll be with you. I'll be with you in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the heartache, in the midst of the suffering, midst of the challenges. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to love you through this. But he never promised it it was going to be easy. He never said you're not, you're not going to have any more problems after you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He never said that. Actually, he tells us it's going to be pretty hard, doesn't he? But he also tells us he's going to hold our hand every step of the way. 
Folks, this is important to know, to know that he's always with us because there are times in our lives that we don't feel that he's always with us. So it's important that we know that he's there. Even in our doubt, our fear, and our pain. There's a story, it starts out in John chapter 20, verse 19. This is after the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. They've heard he's alive, but they haven't seen him. They're scared to death what's going to happen. What happened to Jesus is going to happen to them. And so we find these disciples are locked in a room. Doors and windows shut, locked, scared to death, shaking in their boots. Or probably their sandals. Right? John 20, 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors. Say that with me. Say locked doors. Okay, louder. I want you to understand they were locked doors, right? And then because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, they were locked. Suddenly, Jesus was standing among them. And he says, peace be with you, he said. What's this tell me? Well, they're behind locked doors. They're scared to death. They're facing the giant of doubt. They're facing the giants of anxiety. And Jesus appears. Locked doors. Doesn't say he jiggled the door a little bit. Doesn't say he knocked three times. Right? It didn't say there's a secret Jesus knock. Just says that he appeared. So what's that mean for me? That means that when I can't get out, when you can't get out, he can always get in, no matter what you're facing. We serve a God that a locked door nor a wall can stop. No wall can keep him out because he loves us. So if you're dealing with doubt, this ought to give you some faith, but let's build it up a little more. Verse 24. John chapter 20. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came, and the other disciples therefore said to him, we've seen the Lord. Listen, you ever had that moment when you missed the party? Something great happened. I heard a story not long ago of where President Bush showed up at a church service, but it was not announced that he was coming. And if you didn't go that Sunday, you missed. Did I say President Bush? Or did I say Trump? My brain's not working here. President Trump showed up. But nobody, it was not announced that he's coming. So if you missed it, you missed it. You missed the party, right? Let's say it'd be something like, um, you missed last week's church service. It was incredible. You can't believe it. Steve was amazing. He levitated on stage, right? It was crazy. It's like 100 people got baptized, and you weren't there, and you missed it. And you're like, I had to work. But you keep talking about it, and you keep talking about it, and finally they say, shut up. I don't want to hear it anymore. That's what's happening here. Thomas is sick of hearing these guys talk about, hey, Jesus was here, and you missed it. Right? And so what he does is he puts this caveat in his faith. Look what he says to him. He says, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails... And I put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side. I will not believe. Uh Uh-oh, kids. Think about it. We get a problem here. Because he's a disciple and he's declaring, I will not believe unless Jesus does this and he does this and he does this. Wow. That's a disciple. That's one that's walked with Jesus for three years. Jump down to verse 26 and look what it says. After eight days. His disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came to the door, and it was being shut. And he stood in the midst, and he said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, time out right there. Thomas didn't say a word to him. Thomas didn't tell him about his doubts. Thomas didn't tell him about what he wanted to see and what he wanted to touch. Jesus jumped right into that. He knew what Thomas needed from him. And he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here. And look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Now you know what I love about this whole thing? He's already shown up to the guys, right? 
He's already come up through the locked doors. He's there. They got excited. They're all pumped up about it. You know what happened? But this time, they've all seen him. So who's he come back for? He comes back for one. He come back just to show Thomas. Listen, he's showing up for just one. And that's what he does with us. He shows up for us. We've got to trust. Listen, this morning, he knows where you are. He knows what your heart's going through. And maybe today, just today, maybe he's come just for you. That's hard to trust, isn't it? What do you do when you don't have any faith? That's where Thomas was. He didn't have any. What did he do? Well, he hung around a bunch of people who did have faith. For eight full days, he stayed with his group. He didn't run off into the desert by himself. He didn't go off and try to do it alone. He didn't try to figure it all out in his own mind. He stayed with people that he knew could build his faith. Listen, if you're sitting here today or you're watching us online today, and you're right now, man, you just don't have any faith. The faith of those that are here today, the faith of those that are sitting around you at home, the faith of those that are around you each and every day will lift you up. And I promise you that the holy God that we serve will begin to pick you up as well. I'm here for you. Just for you. 1988, in the country of Armenia, there was an earthquake that in just a few minutes killed 50,000 people. It left 5 million homeless. And Reader's Digest, back in that day, chronicled a story that happened that morning of a young father who took his elementary age son to school, and he did what dads do. He dropped him off. He told him the things that dads say. Son, I love you, you know. I'll pick you up this afternoon. Just remember who you are. You know, all those things that dads say. And then he drove off. About a mile down the road, he watched as the road rippled in front of his car. Buildings began to sway side to side. He knew what was happening. And in horror, he turned his vehicle around and he precariously made his way back to the elementary school. Only to find it was flat. And with only the terror that a father can feel, he left the door open on the car, he left the car running, he jumped out, and he ran over, he crawled, he did whatever he had to do to get across the rubble to the approximate location of his son's class. And he began to dig. And he began to dig. And he dug, and he dug, and he dug, and he dug some more. He dug for hours. People would come over to him and say, hey, this is futile, you're wasting your time. We're not equipped to handle this. What, what if you hurt yourself? What if your wife not only doesn't have a son, but she now doesn't have her husband either? you got to stop. For eight hours, he dug. Ten hours, he dug. Twenty hours, he dug. Twenty-four hours, he dug. People would bring him water to drink. Some would come and help dig with him. And finally, they began to realize that all he was doing was digging his grief out. He's just digging out his own grief. But in the 36th hour, Daddy heard a noise. And when he heard that noise, he screamed, Help! Somebody help! And they came, and they helped him unearth a rock. And when they unearthed this rock, there was a cavern. And in this cavern were 13 students and a teacher. And one of those students was his son. He looked at his daddy, and he said, I kept telling them that you would come. Wow. Here's what I want you to understand. That's a human story. My Bible says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your Heavenly Father want to give good gifts to you? So let me promise this. You got a holy God who loves to remove doubt and fear and anxiety. And he's coming for you. And it may be today. 
It may be tonight. It may be when you're sitting all by yourself on Tuesday night. But he's going to come. Because you see, even in the midst of the pain, even in the midst of the doubt, even in the midst of our lack of trust, he is with us. He has promised he will never leave us. And you can count on it. Folks, I pray when you face the giant of doubt in your life, that you understand that you're not facing this giant alone. Because you're facing this giant with a full force of a giant slayer that's right inside of you. God, a giant slayer, is with us. Even when we don't know where to find him, he is there. The giant of doubt comes. We can't stop it. But I trust today you now know how that you can better deal with it. Know that he is always present with you. Through the pain, through the anxiety, through the doubt, God will never leave you, and he will never forsake you. 